This conference will now be recorded. Hi, everybody. Welcome to the August uh, SAN coordinator call. Uh, I'm pleased that you all could be with us today. We have a very jam-packed agenda for today. I'm very excited about it. I have to tell you up front, though, the order that you receive the agenda, that is not the order that we're going to be doing today. Um, we have uh, some special guests who are joining us, and uh, we're going to work that through um, to help to accommodate them. Probably the most important thing that I need to tell you before we get started is that I would really appreciate everyone who is not speaking to have their um have their computers or their phones on mute because sometimes that really sets up for some um, background noise and also uh, please make sure that if you leave your phone that you don't put us on hold um, because sometimes uh, that puts forward uh, some music um, that your institution may be using uh, in the event of a hold. So without further ado, we're going to get started. Um, so welcome again to the August uh, call. And our first very special guest today is uh, Van Davis. And I'm very pleased. Many of you know Van. Um, he has been, uh, he has spoken with us before, and uh, today he is willing to uh, come talk to us a little bit about the most recent department announcement about borrower's defense to repayment and re the proposed regulations. So I think that he is a perfect candidate to help us untangle uh, what was in that announcement. So I'm going to turn this over to Van, and he's given me some slides to be able to share along with that. Van, do we have you with us? You do. Can you hear me, Cheryl? Yes, I can. You sound great. Thank you so much for being on here. Um, before I let him talk, though, I have to brag about him a little bit. Um, so Van is the principal of, and I'm going to pronounce this wrong, Foglum uh, Consulting LLC, where he navigates colleges, universities, nonprofits, and policymakers uh, to understand where higher education is heading and how to navigate that future. Um, as you all may know, he has spent over 20 years in higher education as a faculty member, academic administrator, policymaker, and consultant. After spending a decade uh, as a history a professor, yeah. please make sure you're on mute, okay, folks? Um, as a history professor at both public and private colleges, he joined the Texas Higher Education Board, where he was responsible for distance education policy, the state's multi-million dollar course redesign, and faculty development programs, and organized the state's annual reinventing instruction and learning conference. Uh, sorry, I got lost for a second. Uh, additionally, uh, Van worked with Open Education Resources and oversaw the development of the state's digital learning objects repository. I'm sorry, we're getting a little feedback from some folks who do not have themselves on mute. So I really would appreciate if you would put yourself on mute because it's a little distracting. Okay, so um, as I was saying, and I apologize for the disruption here, much of Van's time at the coordinating board focused on expanding higher education access, especially for returning adult students. He created Grad Tex, TX, Texas, uh, the state's audit degree completion project, as well as the Texas Affordable Baccalaureates project, which resulted in the development of the state's first public competency-based education bachelor's degree and the first multi-institutional competency-based program in the nation. Most recently, Van served as the Associate Vice President of Higher Education Policy and Research at Blackboard where he focused on federal education policy and helped a variety of internal and external stakeholders respond to challenges, challenges around student access and success. Affordability, competency education, te learning technology, workforce development, um, and change management. He currently uh, serves on the board of Peloton U, a 501c3 that provides academic and social support services for post-traditional students enrolled in online competency-based education degree programs. And uh, so Van is a trained facilitator, sought after speaker, as we know. Have the, over the last several years, he's spoken at Educause, OLC, Accelerate, UPSIA's Summit for Online Leadership, WCET's Leadership Summit and Annual Meetings, Texas Distance Learning Association, U.S. Distance Learning Association, CB Exchange, International Freedom from Women in E-Learning, Innovations in Online Learning, as well as speaking in numerous faculty development workshops. Van is often asked to speak about the future of higher ed, competency-based education, college access, affordability, 
pedagogical practices for online learning and the impact of federal and state policy on higher education. Additionally, Van has authored a number of white papers and reports, has served as a contributing editor for the Journal of Competency-Based Education, has testified before several legislative committees. Van holds a PhD and MA in, in 20th century US history with an emphasis on civil rights history from Vanderbilt University, as well as a BA in history from Southwestern University. He has, he has been a professor at Truman State University, Southwestern University, and Houston Tillis, Tillotson uh, University, where he taught a wide range of lower and upper division courses, as well as serving as outside member of an ed uh, doctoral committees. Van uh, currently lives in Austin with his beloved wife, the writer Lisa Estes, and their three cats, where he spends his free time cooking, reading in his hammock, camping, building Lego models, and dreaming about returning to Burning Man, which he attended this time last year. So with now we will let uh, Van take it from here and share with us what he will about borrower's defense to repayment. Um, thanks a lot, Cheryl. And yeah, I was uh, thinking today, um, this time last year, I was uh, somewhere between Las Vegas and um, the Black Rock Desert, and it was much, much hotter than it is uh, where I'm sitting in uh, my air-conditioned office in Austin. So i um, glad I could talk to you guys for a few minutes this morning or afternoon, depending upon where you are. And thanks for the flexibility and letting me go first. I actually have a board meeting um, for Peloton U that I need to be at uh, in a couple of hours this afternoon. Um, Cheryl asked if I would just talk um, really briefly about what's been going on with um, the bar borrower defense um, to repayment regulations uh, since there's been quite a bit uh, that is shifting as we speak, and especially since there's still two days left for the uh, public um, comment period, if you are so inclined to do so and have not done so yet. Um, Cheryl, just logistically really fast, are you, hand, uh, are you in control of the slides or am I? I'm in control and I'm happy okay. to move it along awesome. as you like. Okay. Thank you. If you could go to the, the next slide then, please. So real quick recap on what um, borrower defense to repayment was, at least at one time. Um, it was created in 1995 and it was relatively unused uh, until 2015 and the collapse of Corinthian colleges. Uh, and to give you an idea of how relatively unused it was, between 95 and, and 2015, there were probably a, less than 10 claims per year. Since 2015, um, the Department of Education has indicated that there have been over 100,000 claims. So something that was originally developed actually as a stopgap measure um, for the uh, field, um, the federal, employ uh, federal Family Education Loan, FFEL programs, um, it was never supposed to be a long-term solution. Uh, it was supposed to be sort of a one-year stopgap, and then a negotiated rulemaking process would take place. Um, after that, to put in permanent regulations, that actually didn't happen. And so it wasn't until 2015 after Corinthian Colleges collapsed, and we started seeing a lot of students taking advantage of the program that we saw the Obama Department of Education uh, engage in negotiated rulemaking and then proposed regulations released in 2016. Those proposed regulations never went into effect. Um, had they gone into effect, this is basically what they would do. They would have allowed for loan forgiveness um, in MAS, which is what has been happening actually since 2015, where there are large groups of students that are having loans forgiven and they're not necessarily uh, required to initiate the process individually. Uh, it would have forbade institutions from barring students from pursuing class action lawsuits. Uh, this is fairly important because this is something that was um, specifically targeted in the revised regulations that the department is asking for public comments on right now. Um, those 2016 regulations would have uh, eliminated the statute of limitations on relief, would have established several triggers for requiring institutions to uh, provide the department with letters of credit. It would have restored Pell eligibility to students at closed colleges. And this is also something that's, that's pretty significant given the, the current proposed regulations. The 2016 regs would have allowed students an automatic discharge of their loans 
um, due to an institution's closure if those students did not re-enroll in a program after three years. So they would have seen loans discharged and would not have had to have done anything at all. Uh, as I said, the proposed rules which should have gone into effect last year did not go into effect uh, in DeVos's Department of Education. Um, they were delayed and uh, instead a uh, negotiated rulemaking process was engaged in between late 2017 and early 2018. And we saw um, at the end of last month that the uh, Department of Education then released the new proposed regulations that are out for public comment right now. Um, Cheryl, would you move to the next slide? So one of the things that um, is very telling about this, this the, the context for uh, what we're seeing happening with borrow defense to repayment is also uh, the larger context is the deregulation that we're seeing happening um, at the department in general, whether that be um, the uh, borrow defense to repayment, whether it be um, what I'm sure Russ is going to be talking about in terms of uh, taking a look again at semester credit hour regulations, whether it be um, income, this is all part of a philosophical push from the Department of Education uh, around deregulation. Um, about this time last year, uh, Betsy DeVos spoke at the uh, McKinnick Island, Michigan Republican Conference. And you may remember that some of the things that she said got quite a bit of play at the time, especially in Inside Higher Ed and Chronicle of Higher Ed. Um, and again, I think it's important to sort of understand that this is the larger context for what's pushing the current discussions. Uh, she said the time of Washington knows best is over. This approach didn't work. It has not worked and it will never work. President Trump and I know our jobs. It's to get out of the way. And then this is uh, the sort of really infamous uh, statement that she made specifically about the bar uh, defense to repayment regs. While students should have protections from predatory practices, schools and taxpayers should also be treated fairly as well. Under the previous rules, all one had to do was raise his or her hands to be entitled to so-called free money. And so this really, I think, capsulizes the philosophical intent of the current proposed regulations. Uh, it is an attempt to deregulate the industry. It is clearly an attempt to um, focus on school and taxpayer fairness and the whole we we hear that taxpayer um, fairness come up a lot uh, with this idea that uh, taxpayers shouldn't be on the hook for um, loans that have been defaulted on by students that shouldn't be on the hook for um, the money that students were given as loans if a student if an institution then closed or defrauded that that individual but it's also, I think, indicative, and it's something we see in the proposed rules. It's also indicative of this philosophical belief that um, higher education is really probably a private good and not a public good. The public is talked about in terms of um, taxpayers and uh, stewardship of funds. Uh, it's not the higher education is not being talked about for the most part in terms of providing a general public good. And I think that's important to say up front because it is definitely one of the things that is um, shaping the proposed regulations. Uh, Cheryl, would you go to the, the next slide, please? So what are the proposed regulations? Um, the regulatory purpose, as the department defines it, I think is really interesting. Um, they want to create clear, consistent, and transparent process for borrowers uh, who have been harmed by their school's misconduct to seek, to seek debt relief. Um, they believe, the department has been very clear that they believe that the current regulations are not clear and that they are um, not uh, very concise and they're difficult to move through and not efficient. Um, they want to, we see this language again here, better protect the interests of taxpayers. Uh, and then this is something that I think is, is important for us. The proposed regulations include measures that support prospective and enrolled students in their obligation to be informed consumers and responsible borrowers. 
Um, and they elaborate on that by saying that the department's goal is to enable students to make informed decisions prior to college enrollment rather than rely on financial remedies after the fact. And so it's very clear, again, the subtext of the proposed regulations is very clear um, in shifting the um, need for evidence um, from the institutions to students. And we see that when we see what the major components of these proposed regulations are. Um, there is a new standard that's being proposed uh, for proving in intentional misrepresentation by institutions with the emphasis on intentional misrepresentation. Um, the proposed regulations prioritize internal arbitration at the institution. So students would need to go through the arbitration process um, at an institution first, um, as opposed to in the prior regulations that the Obama administration propagated that um, de-emphasized institutional arbitration. In fact, it, it made it so that students did not have to go through that institutional arbitration, which can oftentimes be stacked against students. Uh, the, the new proposed, the, the Trump proposed regulations would also restrict the time frame that students could apply um, for a discharge of loans. It removes the departmental authority for group relief. Uh, and so there would no longer be group relief and instead um, the department could only look at individual cases, which um, many um, are concerned would significantly slow down the process for students receiving a discharge of their loans uh, because of borrower defense. It would remove that automatic loan discharge after three years ability. Uh, it would also require students to show financial harm. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in a sec. And this is another sort of huge difference. It would make it, uh, it would make students ineligible for a discharge if they chose not to participate in an institutional teach out plan. So there's a significant shift, which I'm sure doesn't come as a surprise to any of us uh, in terms of the deregulation here. Um, could you move to the next slide, Cheryl? So that proposed misrepresentation standard is probably the thing that has gotten the most attention because it's um, a fairly significant change. Uh, and these are our and, statements, not or statements. So for a student to be able to um, claim that an institution has misrepresented itself, um, they would have to show evidence of these three things, that there had been a false, misleading, or deceptive claim, that the institution made it knowingly that it was false, misleading, or deceptive, or with a reckless disregard of truth. So the, a student to be able under these new proposed regulations to be able to access borrower defense would not only have to show that there was false, misleading, or deceptive claims, but that it was done purposefully by the institution, that it was done knowingly. So they have to actually show institutional intent, which is, I think, again, um, a sort of significant shift uh, and shifting responsibility for evidentiary um, claims to the student rather than to the institution. And that, and, and again, this is sort of critical here, and assuming that they are able to show that it was false and misleading or deceptive, that those statements were made intentionally, a student then has to show that those statements very directly and clearly related uh, to them making a direct loan for, for enrollment at the institution. Um, so, in other words, the student then applied for enrollment and applied for financial aid on the basis of those statements. Uh, and it also then says that in order to be considered related to a provision of educational studies, uh, misrepresentations must be related to the borrower's program of study. So it again, it becomes even more specific that not only do any of these statements have to be um, false and misleading and intentional and impacted the student's decision to enroll, but it also has to be very, very directly related to the student's program of study. So if an institution had made these comments and it was not directly related to the, to the individual's program of study, then they would still, not, the, under these new proposed new regulations, students would not be eligible for asking for their loans to be discharged on the base of fraudulent claims. 
Um, and finally, a student has to show very specifically that the, um, those statements caused them financial harm. Uh, and again, uh, sort of a new evidentiary standard um, that is being um, placed on the shoulders of students. Uh, Cheryl, would you go to the next slide? The other huge shift um, that uh, these proposed regulations has is that um, the department is very specifically in its request for comments asking people to talk about whether or not they should continue to allow students to make what are called affirmative claims, which is uh, a claim for um, discharging loans before a student, uh, while a student is still in good standing before they have defaulted versus defensive claims. And a defensive claim then would be when a student uh, applies to have loans discharged after they have defaulted on those loans. And the department seems to be indicating here that they would like to move towards a defensive claim rather than allowing students to make affirmative claims, which is the current practice. And that has some really huge repercussions. Um, it would most likely significantly reduce the amount of uh, the number of students who are able to ask for uh, a discharge of their loans um, because they would have to default before they could discharge before they could apply for discharge. Um, it also would most likely mean that um, borrowers would have a very brief window to make that application, that sort of one or two month window whenever they are protesting collection proceedings. Um, there are concerns that many borrowers might not know that they would be eligible uh, for discharge relief during that period. And because that um, window for making a claim would be so small that uh, they would not have an opportunity to secure uh, legal assistance or other assistance in navigating um, this process of applying for discharge. And again, remembering that there's going to be higher evidentiary standards for them under these proposed regulations if they go through than, than they've had before. There's also, um, a, I think, interesting concern that this could um, significantly impact um, military members and their families um, because of security clearance issues. If an individual is going to be required to go into default before they can file an application for discharging their loans, um, that will have some impact on the number of individuals who are able to get security clearance or maintain their security clearances. Right now, one of the um, largest reasons for having security clearances denied has to do uh, with finances. And so military students specifically could be harmed under, or there's the potential for harm under these proposed regulations. Um, it also, again, because of that requirement to go into default before asking for or applying for discharge, it also could disproportionately um, harm students' uh, employment prospects if they are employing for jobs where credit checks are being run, as well as their ability to make large purchases of houses, cars, anything that would require a credit check. Um, and so this is a, a pretty significant shift. Now, it's important to note that the department doesn't seem wedded yet to this idea of moving only to defensive claims versus currently allowing affirmative or defensive claims. It's also, I think, interesting to note that um, even uh, organizations um, like the Heritage Foundation that have historically been in favor of what the department is doing, uh, the Wall Street Journal uh, is another one of those, have, have said that um, this idea of only defensive claims may not be a good idea. In fact, uh, the Wall Street Journal, I believe, ran an editorial uh, last month where they said, you know, um, this idea of moving only towards defensive claims mars an otherwise reasonable set of uh, proposed regulations. Um, Cheryl, could you move to the next slide? So where do we go from here? 
uh, you've got until August 30th, so another two days, uh, should you like to make public comments. Uh, and you've got the, um, uh, I'm assuming, Cheryl, you'll uh, um, provide this to folks the deck afterwards, but I've got yes. a link here to the Federal Register, which um, has you know, all, I believe, 250, 300 pages of the proposed regulations, uh, as well as the information on how to uh, make a public comment. There's also um, sort of three other links here that I think um, could be interesting reading for folks. One is a New York Times editorial um, that was released the other day uh, talking about um, this idea of borrowed defense and student debt. Uh, one is an article that the Chronicle of Higher Ed, and this is actually um, open for everyone. It's not one of their paywall uh, articles, uh, but there's an article that the Chronicle did last month um, when these were first promulgated, uh, and then a really nice piece at the Inside Higher Ed, uh, which also sort of walks through the proposed regulations and gives you sort of a nice Cliff Notes version. Um, you want to go to the last slide, uh, Cheryl? Um, and so, you know, I'm happy to um, take any questions uh, if folks have them. You know, again, I think that we have to see this in a larger context of the direction that the department has been going and seems to continue going. And I'm sure as Russ is probably going to talk about, you know, we're seeing this happen, happen with other um, types of regulations. Um, it also, I think, is going to be really interesting to see um, what happens after the midterm elections. Um, you know, last year, I'm not sure that the department was as concerned about higher ed. Um, this year, there seems to be a little bit more interest in higher ed. And again, now with a uh, uh, undersecretary for higher ed who's been nominated, it'll be interesting to see where things go as well. Um, but uh, if folks got questions, I'm happy to uh, give a shot at answering them. We live in interesting times. If you all have any questions, you can either put it in the chat box or uh, just indicate to me that you have a question verbally. Van, we really appreciate you being on the call today to be able to to take us through this. this for some of us, this is not our normal wheelhouse. So to be able to have you um, break it down for us was really helpful. I really appreciate that. Uh, always happy to help out. It's uh, it's a uh, we live in interesting times right now. Yes, we do. Yes, we do. Um, and, and just to reiterate what um, Van said about the, the slide deck, I will be posting these. As you've noted on our new website, everyone has access to the SAN coordinator call um, agenda recording and any um, other handouts or presentations are all available on the SAN website. So you have access to that. And Russ says, way to go, Van. Um, yes, I echo that. So, uh, Van, thanks so much for being on this. If people have questions, uh, they may contact me and I may be in touch with you. I hope you don't mind if sure. we do it that way. But people may have questions after they've um, had a chance to try to um, to uh, think about this for a little bit. So thanks again, Van, and good luck in your meeting today. i got to let you go so you can go to your meeting. So All right. it was great to have you today. Thanks, guys. Take care. Bye-bye. Okay. Um, as I was saying to you all earlier, um, we're doing our agenda a little bit uh, different order. Um, and next, we have Megan Raymond, who's the Assistant Director for Programs and Sponsorship with WCET, to give us a little bit of an overview of the WCET annual meeting. You know that the SAN Coordinator meeting is actually held on the Monday, and the Tuesday is when the WCET annual meeting will start. That's so our coordinator meeting can be a 10 to 4 all day, and then we'll move on to have a SAN gathering after that, as noted here. Um, so I'm going to turn this over to Megan and talk a little bit about what, you know, we can see, we can look forward to at the WCET annual meeting. Megan? Great. Thanks so much, Cheryl. And had I known I was going to be following that tough act, I might have asked to be placed later in the agenda. It's always tough to follow up behind Van, but I guess it's better than be being behind Russ and Van. Can you? We're just glad to have you, Megan. <laughs> I'm thrilled to be here. Thank you. Can you make me the controller or either bring up the WCET annual meeting website and then I can walk through some of the program highlights? And I will put the link in.
This conference will now be recorded. Okay. Do I have the powers? Oh, you're going to pull it up there. Great. Can everybody see the 2018 annual meeting program? Russ says yes, so we're going with that. Okay, great. And of course, inevitably, the WCET train just went by. All right. Well, hopefully you found much value in what Van had to share, and that's just a little glimmer into some of the wonderful policy people that we showcase at the WCET annual meeting. Russ included and many, many others in our community come and share with the attendees what they need to know from a smaller scale at their institution to a broader scale and really how to translate that policy back to your institution. So this is just a, a glance at the agenda. Hopefully you've been to our website and you've perused it a little bit. All you have to do is click on program and it does take a moment to load, but then there's some nice features I wanted to walk you through. There's this filter option here. So if there are speakers that you're really interested in uh, or times, for example, let's find Russ here. Then you can simply filter that out and see all of the sessions that Russ is on. So this is a great way and you can also just search through and see what topics are interested to you and you can begin to build your own agenda. And we'll be rolling out the mobile app soon which has a more robust search feature. But some of the sessions I really think that you all would be interested in are these ones that Russ is on. Uh, this one, hey, my crystal ball is broken, includes Russ, Ken Solomon, who I'm sure you've had some interaction with through the SAN group, he's a, a, an attorney heavily involved with higher ed policy, and Leah Matthews, who is an accreditor with DIAC, the Distance, Ed Distance Education Accrediting Commission. And that'll just be a fun conversation and you'll get to ask many of your own questions to them. We have a session on accreditation and quality and there's quite a focus this year on accessibility and what that looks like across institutions, what are some of the good practices, what you should be looking at. So those are just a few of the highlights, but again, I want to encourage you to register for the SAN meeting if you haven't already. It looks like we only have a handful of the 94 that are here registered. So be sure to register for the SAN meeting and then plan on staying for the duration of the meeting. It's a great opportunity to network with people in all sorts of walks of life in higher ed. We have a small group of faculty and instructional designers, but a lot of people that are involved in state authorization, in uh, distance ed policy, and uh, all, all the gamut. So it's a great way to network and connect with people. And if I hadn't mentioned it, this is our 30th anniversary, so it'll also be quite a celebration. So I just wanted to step you through some of those processes so that you can really start to create your own agenda. But if there are any specific questions, please ask. And I don't know if Cheryl, if you have anything you want to add specific to SAN. I just appreciate you being on today. I'm not seeing any questions as such. Oh, um, yes, we do have one question. Megan, will there be an app? Yes, we are getting ready to roll out the app. That'll probably be released close to the early bird deadline of September 21st. And like I said, that is the way that you can really start to search and create your own personal agenda. So this add to my agenda that you see on the website here is just connected to your IP address. You don't actually have to create an account. But with the mobile app, you can build a calendar and you can also access the attendee list. The official hashtag is WCET18. Another question that was in the chat box. Great. Thank you for adding that, Megan. Uh, and thank you for the question, Dave.
Uh, the only other thing that I would like to add for our SAN members is that this is a good opportunity for um, to learn something new. So as I suggested last year and I'm suggesting again this year, you're going to want to um, reach out and do these different sessions because this having this kind of information is important um, to be able to communicate at your institutions and collaborate with the other departments at your institution. So having cursory knowledge of a variety of these higher ed issues is going to be beneficial in the long run. Um, Megan, I'm going to take back control here. I'm not seeing um, other questions at this point, other than Russ included the hashtag, which I appreciate. Um, so is it going back yet? Megan, do you see that it's going back? Okay. Do you all see, uh, can folks tell me if they see the agenda coming back up? Okay, can you all hear me? Yes, okay. Not yet? No, okay. Um, well, I'm gonna keep talking a little bit and we'll wait for it to, to okay, now they can hear me. Okay, thanks for uh, working with us on this, um, on the technical issues. Uh, I, as we try to get the agenda back up, I think I would like to go ahead and thank Megan again for being on today. I know you have a meeting as well. And so I'm really thankful that you took time out of your day to address our folks because the WCET meeting is so valuable. And I hope that people will take advantage of not only the SAN coordinator meeting that precedes the, the annual meeting, but also the annual meeting itself. So thanks again to Megan. Um, while I'm working on getting this agenda back up, I'm going to turn this over. I'm very excited about this. Uh, our new SAN assistant director uh, went through his orientation two weeks ago. We were together in Boulder with Russ and WCET and Wichy and the NC Sara folks and uh, helped Dan get prepared for his new role as SAN assistant director. And I would like to turn this over to, San, to Dan to introduce himself, tell a little bit about himself and uh, let you all get to know him. Dan? Okay, hi, thanks Cheryl, thanks everybody. Um, I am just, just getting started here as Cheryl's caddy and uh, has have had a good time with that so far. Uh, but prior to that, I spent three and a half years doing state authorization compliance at a four-year public, Virginia Commonwealth University. And before that, I spent five years doing other types of higher education compliance, uh, mostly NCAA on a couple of other campuses. So um, I have a, really have a lot of respect for the chairs that you were sitting in or the stand-up desks that you were hovering over and would love to um, learn as much as I can from you guys and try to really promote SAN as a, as a network. Um, the, the, the more you guys are learning from each other, uh, I think the more successful um, SAN is. Um, I, I think that's, excuse me, a perfect segue over to the summer spotlight. So we have our colleagues, Dave and Kelly, coming to us from Anchorage, Alaska, to tell us a little bit more about what they are doing. Great, thank you, Dan. Can folks hear us? You sound great. Okay, thank you. Uh, well, thank you all for allowing us to say a few words. Um, I am Dave Dannenberg, Director of State Authorization, amongst many other hats here at the University of Alaska at Anchorage, and I'm uh, joined with my, by my colleague Kelly Leipenex, who um, is our distance education analyst and focuses on state authorization. Um, so I'll, I'll start things off just giving you a little bit of the history and then I'll turn it over to Kelly to sort of talk about sort of what she's done over the last few months. Uh, so the University of Alaska Anchorage is one of three institutions in, a, um, in our state, part of our statewide university system. Uh, Alaska was one of the first states to join NC Sarah. Uh, however, the University of Alaska Anchorage was the last higher education institution in the state to actually join. Um, and it wasn't because we weren't interested. Um, it was because our leadership at the time 
just wasn't sure where state authorization should reside. Um, so even though Alaska as a state joined, I think back in 2015, um, it wasn't until uh, the fall of last year, 2017, uh, that we actually applied and became uh, an NCSER institution. During those two years, um, the provost then, and who since has become our interim chancellor, uh, was hoping to put the authorization process and embed that in a couple of other organizations on campus. Um, at first, he looked sort of through some of our faculty governance groups who decreed that they didn't want to do it. Then he gave it to, as a special project, to an interim dean of our honors college. Um, and after two years and me telling him multiple times that if he wanted to move forward with NC Sarah, it would have to be uh, something that my department handled. And in the larger sense, um, the my team were called Academic Innovations and E-Learning, and we handle all the educational technology, professional development, instructional design, just in student services. So it really made sense for something like Sarah to belong here in the first place. Um, so after two years of me telling him that, we finally made it happen. Um, and uh, as part of that process, he also dedicated a half-time position to help me do the sort of the day-to-day -day fundamental work. Um, so beginning last fall, uh, one of the first things I did was join th this group, even before we were an official NC Sarah uh, organization, attended the, um, and met many of you at the last, last year's, I have to get this right, last year's um, workshop in uh, over the summer, early September, somewhere in there, um, and took everything. I had pages and pages and pages of notes. Um, and for folks that know me realize I never take notes uh, and had a long to-do list, immediately got to work, came back. We joined NC Sarah, um, the provost then, chancellor or interim chancellor, gave me a half-time position to help with the work. And um, fortunately, after a search, we were able to hire Kelly, who joined us here in January. Uh, and Kelly's day-to-day, -day, one of the multiple things she does, um, well, one of two things she does is handle the, the state authorization. So building off some of the initial data collection, um, she really got to work and, and started um, laying the foundation of, of our authorization process. And I'll let her say a few words about that. Yeah, um, it definitely feels like it's been fast and furious since January um, and a pretty steep learning curve. I do not come from a compliance background, um, so there was a little, there was quite a bit of learning to, to sort of navigate through. Um, but I will say that one of the things that I found uh, as, a, as a newbie to this, this work um, is just the, the, there are a ton of resources available when you look around the website. Um, I very, very much appreciate any time I have a question, I can go to pretty much anyone, Russ, Cheryl, um, you know, my mentor. Um, regulators actually have been a fantastic resource for us um, as we've kind of navigated through. Once Dave sort of handed this, his giant pile of notes over to me, um, the first thing I did was try to just sift through and, and put a plan together of how we were going to tackle it. Um, you know, looking at the data, uh, everything from setting up a website, researching the state regulations. Um, I'm, I still feel like we're very much in infant stage, but, you know, I would say for any new person out there that it really is just a step-by-step, -step, take it one day at a time kind of process, at least that's what it's been for us. Um, I would I would also, well, I, 
if anyone has any questions, please feel free to, to pop them into the chat box. Um, but I, I still feel like we're, we're, you know, still sort of navigating through it. Um, seems like there's something new every day that, that we learn about it. Yeah, I think that we won't make any claim that we're perfect, but, um, you know, every day we learn something, every day we make a slight change, every day we're refining our processes. Um, and, moving and in the right direction. We're moving in the right direction. Not, not there and, yet, I can't say, no, but we're, we're definitely moving in the right direction. And I would think, I, I would guess most of us feel like we're never there yet, but <laughs> um, this group has proved to be proved to be invaluable as, as we've been on our journey. And for that, I know we're both very thankful. Um, in case you're wondering, because we are in Alaska, the northernmost state um, in, in the country, yes, we are an actual state. We are not a separate country. Um, we do refer to the rest of you as being outside or the lower 48, but generally we just say outside. No, we do not li all live in igloos, nor do we have snow. Well, depending on where you are, you don't have snow on the ground 12 months out of the year. We do not ride moose or polar bears. Um, we do not all wear tinfoil hats to, to protect ourselves from the radiation of the sun. Um, depending on where you are in Alaska, uh, during the summer, you can get 24 hours of light, just like in the winter, you can have 24 hours or three months of darkness. Uh, here in Anchorage, we probably get somewhere in the ballpark of 19 to 20 hours of light in the summer, which means, yes, in the winter, we get 19 to 20 hours of darkness. Um, the sun is usually up for about four to five hours, uh, usually between like 10 and two in the middle of the day. But it is, even though it's on the horizon, it is up, it is bright light. It's just not directly overhead. Um, Which but, all has uh, nothing to do with state authorization. That has nothing to do with- But fun. everything to do with our state. Right. So we're just giving you a little, little background on what it's like to be in Alaska. Well, I think that's great. I appreciate you sharing that. As a former resident of Ontario, I kind of understand a little bit about what you're saying about misconceptions. Um, so that was that was funny. Uh, but more importantly, what I appreciate that you shared is that it's always a journey. We're always moving forward. Things that we thought we knew were were correct a couple of years ago. We're finding needed to be refined and and changed up. And uh, you know, you pointed to that directly, and I really appreciate that because we're all on that same journey together. So we'll continue in that way, and that's why we have our network. So thanks so much for being on today, Dave and Kelly. Um, it was really a treat to to hear you um, and hear you talk about your journey at University of Alaska Anchorage. Thanks very thank much. Our pleasure. Yeah, thank you. Great. Um, okay, I'm going to turn this over to Russ in just two seconds. All I'm going to do, because I want to give him the rest of today, rest of our time today, I want to point to you on the agenda number seven, the SAN Advisory Group nomination and election process. Uh, you received on the listserv um, information about the election for our first SAN Advisory Group. And uh, that inaugural group will come from these 14 nominations. If you go into, the, if you are not, are missing the listserv email, you can email me a or go to about San on the website, and then on about San, you'll be able to scroll there and see um, San Advisory Group, and it has explanation about the San Advisory Group, and will take you to this link that has not only first the PDF of all of the different nominees and the descriptions about them, which I absolutely ask you to read first, but also the ballot. And then you can submit that ballot that um, the election will be open until the voting will be open until uh, September 12th. So please have a look at that. And then also to point out that uh, Tanya Spillavoy will be our um, um, expert of the month next month to talk to us about open education resources, OER. And so bring your questions for her. She is well-versed and can provide a lot of great information to you about state policy and practice. 
um, for OER. And also you'll note here how you can register for um, the WCET annual meeting and the SAN coordinator meeting. And now I would like to turn it over to Russ. And Russ, thank you so much for your patience uh, waiting for your um, point in this agenda. Russ? Great, yeah, thank you. I guess I, I could just say, hey, it's delayed, and then go go on from there, but I, maybe I'll say a little bit more, more about it. Uh, but this uh, federal state authorization regulation has just been the uh, the weirdest thing around with all the uh, ins and outs that it's uh, gone through in the in this uh, uh, almost decade uh, that we've been that they've been working working on all this. And so, as you uh, probably know, that it was uh, uh, that they announced a delay on July second, uh, and then that that date ends up being a, a problem. And I'll talk a little bit about that in a, in a bit, but they, um, uh, based upon uh, a letter that, that uh, we wrote with DIAC and uh, Sarah folks, and uh, they also pointed to a letter from, uh, I think it was ACE, um, that they were saying that they were going to delay it. And, and really their intent was is that they wanted to uh, not enforce it, I think, because they wanted to make it part of uh, negotiated uh, uh, rulemaking. Um, and then I did put in the uh, chat box there that uh, uh, if you're interested in looking at it again, the uh, blog post that uh, Cheryl and I wrote about the negotiated rulemaking and what they were, uh, what they're suggesting there. And so, what negotiated rulemaking is, uh, uh, if you don't don't recall, is just that you get uh, people to talk about a particular regulation and figure out uh, and negotiate. You know, what should that regulation be? Where should it where should it go? And then I served on one in uh, 2014, and Marshall's been on four of them. Uh, the rulemaking rulemaking panel. It's a very interesting process. Now for this one, uh, they are throwing all sorts of things in there. Uh, they have 11 items uh, from accreditation, core functions of accreditation. That's kind of a big thing. Uh, state authorization, uh, regular and substantive uh, interaction, competency-based education, um, uh, uh, faith-based entities, and Title uh, Title IV. So just 11 different things. And uh, everybody I've talked to think that this is just uh, um, a poor way to go uh, because uh, we, uh, the negotiated rulemaking that Marshall and I were on in 2014, we had six items. And to have people who knew about banking and financial aid and state authorization and all these different, uh, and one was had to do about testing, you know, to have people who knew about all these different items uh, was very tough. And you're constantly getting people up to speed as to what uh, what was going on, or they were getting up, me up to speed as to what was going on. So um, this isn't a good. These are very important topics. Accreditation is kind of important. Some of the other credit hours definition that's important, and um, we just don't see how they're going to get uh, um, uh, you know just a, a proper hearing or review uh, in in all of this. They do have two subcommittees that they're going to work with, but uh, uh, we're planning on just, uh, there is there's a comment period coming up, uh, or there's a comment period that's going to be ending September 14th, um, and then we do have information in that blog posts. We do, uh, if you're interested, that uh, we welcome you to uh, comment, but really at this point, we're not really commenting about the substance of the each of the issues. They want to know what, what they should be negotiating. If there's other issues they should add, that just blows my mind. Uh, they've already got too many. Or I think the thing that we're going to comment on is just uh, what I've said, that there's just too much to do this well. And they just either need multiple uh, rulemaking, uh, you know, uh, put this in, a, in, in different uh, different rulemaking panels or at least more sub subcommittees or, or something. And I think we need to go on the uh, – I would like to see us go on the record to say that. And then if any of you – you know, either if you don't do it officially from the institution that you could do it, um, you can comment uh, uh, on your own. Just say that that I'm Dave Dannenberg and here's my title, and, and just you can say that you're what your title is, but just be clear that you're not representing uh, the university because uh, uh, Dave probably likes his job. Uh, so, so those sorts of things. Uh, so you can uh, you can you can comment comment on that if you. Uh, if you wish, and so we'll see what happens with that. Uh, uh, they're probably going to turn this around pretty quickly, and we're looking at the uh, actual negotiated. Uh, uh, they'll be be 
calling for uh, people to be on whatever panels they put together, and we're or we're talking about uh, what we're going to do about nominating uh, people for that and participating in that because uh, we need somebody with uh, uh, state authorization and some of these other issues, uh, you know, strong on those issues to be uh, on that panel, and uh, and maybe there'll be multiple panels. Who knows? Uh, and so that will be next. We're looking for the time frame to be next spring uh, for for them to hold uh, probably um, uh, three sessions so is typically what they do. A lot of issues to get into into three three sessions. With that, the other thing that happened with that, remember I mentioned that the uh, regulation actually came out July 2nd. Uh, we have a, a lawsuit from the uh, National Education Association and the California Teachers Association. I put a, a link to an uh, Inside Higher Ed article uh, about that, that that came out uh, uh, just recently and that they pointed out that the actual delay was published in the Federal Register on July 2nd and the rule went into effect on July 1st, which means that the way that they delayed it is probably not the way you're supposed to delay it. They were supposed to have had that published prior to July, prior to July 1st, prior to it uh, going into effect. Uh, the department is saying that, well, we had the draft posted on June 30th, and that's good enough. Um, others are saying that that's not good enough, and so this will be going to the uh, to the to the courts, uh, I imagine. And that the uh, I was looking through the uh, the brief, and uh, it's interesting that uh, uh, Cheryl Dowd specifically, and WCT, and Witchy, and San, we all get uh, uh, cited in it in terms of. Uh, um, that supposedly the department said that they just figured out that there was a lot to do in February this year when we wrote letters, when they point out that uh, on your behalf that we had written several letters and Cheryl had uh, testified, uh, you know, we'd done this several times in 2017, so it shouldn't have been new to them. Anyway, uh, bottom line, they probably have a point. Uh, they probably didn't follow the right uh, rules in terms of doing this, but I keep coming back to that if they want to delay it, they could probably do like they did in 2010 and just instead of, um, uh, they could just delay the enforcement of, of it. That's what they did back then. And so instead of delaying the enactment, that's a different thing that delayed the enactment or going into effect, effective date, July 1st, they uh, could have missed that, that they could still delay the enforcement. So I'm, uh, I'll be curious to see what happens with this lawsuit. I'll be curious to see how the department uh, responds. I'm not expecting that the courts will say, oh, this is all in place now, and because that would put the institutions in a bad spot to try to figure out, oh, you're supposed to be uh, uh, complying with something that was put on, on hold. And so... So that's a lot of things in a short time, and we've only got a few minutes. I'll stop to see if anyone has any any questions or Cheryl has any uh, additional comments. Well, uh, I do, Russ. Thanks for um, thanks for all of that. Um, but specifically, and I think you addressed this in the notice that went out last week. What should institutions, you know, let's let's reiterate what institutions should be doing um, in light of this? That there are other. Um, obligations of the institution, regardless of the delay, correct? That's right. And as we always say, that there's always the state rules, whether there's a federal rule or not, that the state rules uh, predated them, and that you're still expected to follow all of those, uh, that you, if you are a signee onto SARA, then you're expected to follow those rules. Uh, if you do Department of Defense tuition assistance, that they uh, expect you to follow uh, uh, if you're part of that memorandum of understanding, and you should know that whether you are or not, uh, that they expect you to follow state authorization, that they're uh, still, if the misrepresentation at the federal level is going to be watered down, but that there's lots at the uh, state levels that you should be doing. So it's just a sample of uh, uh, things that you still need to be complying with. Thanks for reiterating that, Russ. Are there any other questions? Uh, I'm not seeing anything in the chat box yet. Um, I know we're getting close to the time, and I, what I want to ask you here is that if you do have questions, please don't hesitate to email Russ or myself. Um, we would be glad to respond. Um, we covered a lot of material today, and all of it will be available on the SAN website by the end of the week. 
um, we'll get this rec this recorded um, version up and get it get the transcript up. So you will have all of this by the end of the week as an archive to review um, to be able to see all of the information that we shared today. Thank you, Russ, very much for sharing where we are with the federal regulation. It seems to change every day. I, when we asked you to do this um, was prior to the lawsuit coming out. So that was yet another aspect that you needed to include. And I appreciate that very much. Um, so thanks, everybody, for being with us today. Um, as I said, we covered a lot of material. Look forward to talking with you all in September. And in the meantime, please have a look at the uh, a possibility of attending the annual meeting and attending the SAN coordinator meeting. We would enjoy having you. Have a great day, everybody. Take care.